Hello everyone, it is Joe here from OmniPoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. If you're looking for PTCGO codes, including the stuff from Pokemon Go, make sure you check out the Potown store. You can get a 5% discount on your order using that code OmniPoke. For today's video, we're continuing with the World's Deck Spotlights for London 2022. This time it's going to be Mew Genesect once the big bad of the format is taking a bit of a backseat to some of the V-stars in the game right now, but still is one of the best point earners, at least in the Astral Radiance metagame. Uh, surprisingly enough, even though it's not had quite as many uh, top 8 placements, it's still getting a good amount of top 32 and 64 placements, so it is still one of the most consistent earners in the game right now. The general strategy is that we're going to try and flood our board as quickly as possible with lots of fusion Pokemon. That's because the ability on Genesect V allows us to draw up until the number of fusion strikers we have in play. And we can do this multiple times. So often you will see a board of lots of Genesects uh, all in play because you can use them multiple times. We can t continue to filter down our hand size with some of these ball search cards like Quick and Ultra Ball. Even cards like Cramomatic, Flipping Tails, can be good enough for you here and there because it will lower your hand size to continue digging deeper into the deck with Fusion Strike System. It makes Mew one of the most dangerous turn one decks actually. Uh, especially going uh, second when you can be dishing out huge damage with a Melodious Echo from a Meloetta if you're able to get an Alessa Sparkle and also attach Fusion Energy for the turn. You can be reaching upwards of 210 pre-damage modifiers uh, with this Echo and that's absolutely fantastic for you and can pressurize two prize Pokemon as early as turn one which is insane, to be honest. It's some of the highest tempo you can have in the game, and there's not much the opponent can do really in response if they've only got one two-prizer down, and that's like their main attacker that they're trying to turn into a V-star, and you just take it out of play. They basically give you a free turn, which is absolutely insane. At the same time, uh, we have the Mew itself, which has just got a pretty decent chunk of hit points, the 310 naturally here. We can try and get a little bit chunkier with an Oricorio as well to push us even further out of range of one hit KOs. And we can use the cross fusion strike attack to copy Meloetta, Genesect, or the Mew V as well. So it's a quite a versatile attacking Pokemon. Also having this Max Miracle inbuilt in the deck gives us a natural answer to Mill Tank, so we don't have to adapt our deck too much uh, in order to have answers there. Of course, being a Fusion Strike Pokemon means we have the Power Tablet available to us, and this is one way that we can really improve our damage output. Yes, Melodious Echo can get extremely high damage if you have all full Fusion Energy into play, but really we're looking to use Techno Blast in a lot of situations alongside multiple Power Tablets and even the Choice Belt to reach into those 280 hit point V stars. So something that you really want to keep track of throughout the entire game and oftentimes rain down these power tablets all in one turn to reach into big one hit KOs. Onto the matchup spread and it has got a little bit dicey for Mew out there as one, once upon a time, you know, it, it was mostly just dark decks trying to combat this deck. Now dark is almost completely out of the format and still we see that there aren't too many favorables for Mew out there. Surprisingly enough, I would have thought Regigigas would be one of the more difficult matchups intuitively because Reggie can get one hit KOs. Uh, but it turns out just on the online data at the very least, I'm taking this all from Trainer Hill, by the way, none of this is opinion. This is all just the online results that we've seen uh, across this month. Uh, Mew is seemingly feasting on the Reggies. Uh, also pretty good into the Stone Journal, where you just have very consistent damage output the entire game. Uh, so much so that the Stone Journal can't really comfortably heal out of range, especially because you have that variable damage output with power tablet turns or getting a sparkle attach off early. Uh, that's very bad for the Stone Journal. And also, of course, decent into the Urshifu, where the Urshi itself can't feel safe when there's a big Psychic VMAX uh, staring down the Urshifu. And most Urshi lists are going to towards a water approach and taking out the sort of dark package that we saw uh, at the EUIC, which was the only thing keeping the Mew matchup uh, winnable. Uh, so now it's pretty good for Mew to face the Urshis. 
Also seems pretty good into Ice Rider. Uh, typically, Mew was always decent into uh, three prize matchups because you do have the potential to go over the top and get a one hit kill all in one turn with a ton of power tablets coming into play, but also just staying out of range, especially with the help of uh, your fusion energy, stopping Inteleon pings and having Oracorio at your disposal means that you normally are staying way out of uh, Ice Rider range and uh, you can always Psychic Cleap if need be as well. Dialga also seems to be pretty reasonable for you. You have a ton of tempo pressure. Uh, if they are trying to play Diancy, there can be catcher builds that can get around this as well. So another thing to bear in mind there. Interestingly, you're pretty even against every uh, arc matchup. Some are 48%, some are like 53%, but uh, it's all within that sort of range. So against the uh, Arceus, no matter what uh, flavor of Arceus it is, uh, you're pretty much even into them, which is uh, not necessarily a good or bad feeling, I would say. Um, there are a few variations here as well, of course. So the Duraludon, uh, you have to play quite conservatively, of course, and it can be better or worse based on what energy count you're sort of going for and how much healing they have available. The Arc Peak obviously has uh, most likely a dark backup attacker in the Crobat VMAX, so that's something to try and navigate, and they naturally play the highest amount of Marnie and Path, I would imagine, out of all these lists. The Arc Gyarados still likely to be playing a good amount of Path, um, and you just have to play around the Get Angry attack from the uh, the Gyarados, really. And then the Arc Intel is going to, once again, play a good amount of Path and have Roxanne at its disposal um, just straight away from a Shady Deal, so it's basically something that you always have to navigate in those later game stages. Uh, so... There's a few intricacies here between all the matchups, but they all seem pretty winnable for Mew. Uh, Bliss Tank, you know, you're not really too afraid by the Mill Tank itself, but Blissey can get a little bit scary into you and has a ton of healing options and is once again a quad path deck. Sometimes these even play hammers, which is something to bear in mind. Turbo Palkia seems reasonable for you here and there. So uh, again, a pretty even matchup, I would say. Unfortunately, the Inteleon matchup is looking slightly negative. Naturally, at the start of the video, I said that you want to go wide uh, with your board, and that just plays into Palkia's hands, where they can have very high damage output thresholds on you, especially because Leon is becoming uh, a fairly common card, I would say, in the Palkia and Teleon. They can even reach one hit goes, even when you're using the likes of Oracorio to be one of your board spaces so that you can draw more from the Genesect without it sort of adding towards the Palkia's damage, because it basically cancels out with the reduction of damage that it offers they can still find sneaky ways of getting big one hit KOs you also seem to be relatively unfavorable into the Radiant Zard now I'm not sure if this is mostly because they can go for a 2-2-2 prize plan against you so well or if uh, there's still a number of intel builds that are playing like somewhat of a dark package uh, so something to bear in mind I remember Inteleon Dark Box was always quite unfavorable as they adapt towards Charizard, it may not necessarily be getting worse, but could still be a bit of an issue. The Lunar Rock is also somewhat of a headache uh, with good damage output, and um, even though you have your Psychic League available to you, they can normally spread a ton of their energies around the board and maybe even reach one hit goes, or just go for a heavy boss approach when they split up their energies onto two Lunar Tones. Something to bear in mind there. The uh, Mewtwo Mill Tank, also not necessarily the easiest. The Mewtwo V Union Control... Uh, normally this is because they are playing Crushing Hammers and also Yveltal, so definitely a fear factor there, uh, based on them just getting too many hammers or being able to do some big cry of destructions to remove a ton of your energy all at once, so certainly one that you need to be experienced up against. Even though you have great answers to the mill tank and you can do good damage into the Mewtwo, it's getting towards that late game and making sure you have enough energy to actually see yourself through um, to get into a winnable board state. The Zoroark deck, also not necessarily the easiest. Zoroark itself is a dark type attacking threat uh, that can put good damage into you, uh, especially with like choice belting and dealing with your Mew V. Also, of course, you play a lot of abilities, which plays into the hands of Flapple, which is oftentimes used. And they also have good late game bombs with the likes of Slowbro as well. So again, the Zoroark can do a good gusting Genesect game plan and rely on Slowbro as a late game option. And the Malamar also seems to be slightly unfavored I never really felt comfortable as a Malamar player going into the Mew matchup, but um, the prize map is there, and it's not necessarily the hardest thing in the world for the Malamar to deal with, because Mew doesn't have any hand disruption, so at least they're able to build their hand and make combos happen, and that's always a worry for a deck like Malamar that can 
have those big pop-off turns and have the reach to get one-hit KOs when necessary. On to a skeleton list then, and uh, this is going to be 50 cards. There's not too much to say here. A very straightforward line of just Fusion Strike Pokemon makes a ton of sense to maximize the value of your Fusion Strike system from Genesect. Play a ton of Ball Search, maxing out all these copies. Maxing out Chromomatic, I think, is pretty core, cool, although I have seen some lists that go down to three copies. I think four is so essential, especially because you want to have the 50-50 outs uh, against Path of the Peak here and there. So that you can actually, um, you know, if you draw into this off of a Marnie or off of a Roxanne and it comes alongside an uh, item card, you at least have that 50-50 punt to try and get out of the lock, which is going to be so important. And it really is how you have some of your most explosive turn ones going second as well, where it allows you to piece together VIP passes, sparkles... Uh, the extra fusion energy to attach onto a Meloetta, all of these sorts of things. The cram is just so flexible on those heads flips. It's worth uh, the sort of heartache of getting tails here and there. Uh, we're sticking with Rose Towers. I think they've proven themselves to be the strongest stadium. Two is kind of the lowest end, I would say, for Mew. And I personally prefer a three slash four count. It makes me feel much more confident and comfortable due to the amount of path that's currently in the format. Not much else to be said really about the list. Very straightforward overall. How else can we fill these slots then? I think uh, what you've seen so far is just the Kramomatics, and normally it's going to be adding in, I would say, at least three more spaces, two to three more spaces with some additional draw. Trekking Shoes coming out of Astral Radiance is certainly a decent one because it gives you even more cycle. It gives you extra ways of discarding uh, VIP passes that were unused on that first turn um, just naturally off the top of your deck. You can just see extra cards and just get deeper into the deck, which is never a bad thing. Also has some minor synergy with cards that you didn't see in the skeleton list, like Silene, where you can flip coins with Silene and then uh, like shoe straight into it. Um, that could be in situations where you're Silening for a stadium card, for example. So there are some minor synergies there. Rotom Foam was used pre-trekking shoes and is still a great way to look at the top five cards and cherry pick things to the top. This can be really nice uh, in the early stages where you can try and access those VIP passes even off just a few draws of potentially Rose Tower or just like a uh, Genesect, even if you're only drawing like one or two cards. It can be a great bailout option and it can just keep you from drawing things in the wrong order for the majority of the game, which is always a nice thing to bear in mind. But the Switch Cups is sort of that retroactive situation where you have drawn something badly, you want it to go back on top of your deck and you want to see an additional card. Also, the Switching Cups can combine very nicely with Ball Search cards. You play a Switch Cup to put something like a Fusion Energy back on top of the deck, then you play a Ball Search card to shuffle your deck, and then you draw with your next Genesect, knowing that now that you have uh, shuffled the deck, there's a random chance and you're much less likely, of course, to not draw back into that Fusion Energy than having it like guaranteed on the top, right? So it's a way that you can fix bad hands, which is also something to bear in mind. And at the very least, it's a minus one guarantee, just like a Rotom phone is. And also from Pokemon Go, there's Pokestop. I know this does divide some opinion and obviously you have to be careful with Pokestop in this deck because there can be big ramifications if you poker stop aggressively and happen to lose something like a fusion energy or lose like a mu v max or something like that things can go wrong losing one too many bosses can be game losing at times so definitely a card you have to use sparingly but actually due to the density of items that you have especially once you've used your lesser sparkles and you've taken the fusion energy out of the deck, the Pokestop can be a fantastic way for you to try and reach these big combos where you're looking for belt double tablets and whatnot this can be a real bailout option for you and you know if your hand is going nowhere in the opening stages similar to how a rose tower can help you the poker stop is at least something you can go for to get into the game in the first place and see sometimes three new cards Onto some tech options then, not quite based on draw. Uh, Pokemon Catcher is certainly an aggressive approach that we have seen from the Mew, uh, so that you can just cherry pick Pokemon that are on your opponent's bench, especially, again, if you are that player going second, you can try and get the dream combo of getting a Catcher Heads as well as getting your um, Meloetta powered up for a one-hit KO. And then you really do wreck your opponent's board state, especially if it's likely going to be Inteleon engines where they only get one sort of main attacker down because they just have so few plays in the opening stages. Uh, you can really ruin your opponent's day with some big catcher heads. 
And of course, it allows you to get a little bit more creative with Catcher Heads plus Sparkle, allows you to get much higher damage output thresholds or build attackers out of nowhere that the opponent may not have expected because they were thinking you would have to boss to be able to pull it off. The Catcher really changes what's in your range and makes the opponent play quite differently. Echoing Horn can also be nice. It allows you to target more low hit point two prizes, which I think is very helpful for the Mew when... Uh, your tablets are, of course, very strong cards, but you have a limited number of them. And when you get into the later stages against uh, V-Stars, typically you can't win a one-hit KO them back to back to back. So you need to sometimes go around them, Echoing Horn, something smaller, and take prizes in that uh, regard. There's also some good recovery options. Palpad uh, and Silene have both seen play in Mew. Silene is very versatile, but it's based on coin flips. The Palpad is basically exactly trying to put boss's orders back into your deck. And then there's also the option for training court to get back uh, basic energy. That would force you to play some psychic energy. And if you do that, there are some uh, arguments to be even adding in Fog Crystal to the list. Fog Crystal being a pretty decent early game card because Mew and Meloetta are normally in your turn one schemes and can also give you an extra search towards uh, energy attachments when need be. And uh, also Pumpkaboo, not necessarily has to go alongside Fog Crystal, but is another way to try and find this card. And Pumpkaboo is an alternative to a stadium card. The main reason you would like to have a, po a Pumpkaboo available is that it really expands how many outs you have, especially in that later game, to have a bounce to a path to the peak because then any remaining Ultra Ball or Quick Ball become guaranteed outs rather than just the physical stadiums that you have left in the deck, as well as like random crams getting heads here and there. So the Pump Kamu can be one of your best defenses to a uh, path to the peak against an opponent. And uh, in the top right, there's some cheeky damage modifiers, the Old Cemetery and the Horror Energy. You don't see very often in Mew, I would say, but the more I see a very heavy V-Star meta, like we're... Expecting a ton of Palkia and a ton of Arceus uh, at Worlds, having this little two counters, either from the Cemetery or the Horror, can be absolutely massive at swinging the amount of resources required to take a response KO onto a uh, V-Star that's hit into you. So it can really change how the opponent needs to play against you. And I think it's actually a pretty solid option, to be honest. If you're thinking Palk and Arc are going to be like maybe half of your day one games in worlds like if you think they're both going to be that popular these tech cards could be actually massive for getting you into range and getting uh big one hit ko's uh, back to back onto v stars so now let's look at some actual 60 card lists the first one is going to be a very cookie cutter straightforward i just want to draw good with mew i just want to you know, if I'm going first, I want to be getting the wide board. I want to be uh, uh, getting the opportunity to boss with a Mew VMAX turn two and knocking out whatever my opponent has. Or if I'm the player going second, I want to be going for Sparkle uh, Meloetta for a KO, whether it's going to be on a two prizer or a one prizer. It doesn't really matter. You just sort of change up how you're using your Sparkle, essentially. Having the double rope in here gives you decent access if your opponent has only got a couple things into play in the early stages. And we're going very heavy on shoes and Rotom Phones. I'm still a big fan of Rotom Phone. I, I know the shoes is kind of winning out in most people's eyes right now. Um, but if you are going to go for the most straightforward build of Mew, I don't mind squeaking a couple phones in as well when you can. On to a Fog Crystal build. I think the biggest benefit of um, playing the Psychic Energy in a couple courts, naturally we're now playing four Stadium Bounces, which is some good peace of mind, of course. Uh, but having double court and one basic psychic uh, gives you actual decent times into the Mewtwo matchup, which I think is otherwise like pretty rough. You probably should just run out of energy against them if you're not playing court and psychic. So this does almost act as a tech card in that instance. And having the Fog Crystal is no bad thing in those opening stages. I've also made space for an Echoing Horn. Again, it's a personal preference card. Doesn't have to go into the list, of course. Could become a second Fog or a third Trekking Shoe. Or as weird as it sounds, even playing one Rotom Phone is like not a bad option because it's just a strong card in general. Uh, so yeah, a couple cheeky cuts here, uh, eating into the sort of shoe count here. Um, but this, this, this does give you some peace of mind into energy, energy disruptors, like even Blissey Miltank uh, will try and play Uveltol here and there. Um, and just those hammers and the Uveltol combo in the Mewtwo deck is something that you probably should be respecting for Worlds as well. Because uh, I do think it could be a decent play term, uh, sorry, in day one. 
Uh, then we have a coin flip build, basically a catcher build, where we are playing double boss and three Pokemon catchers. Also making this room for the one Pokestop. I have played around with Pokestop and I'm pretty okay with the card, to be honest. I think, you know, timing it is obviously an important thing. Uh, you can just consider it like something like an old cemetery and just put it into play and never actually use the effect. But it can also be the sort of bailout option where it just gives you much better push in those later game stages towards hitting your damage modifiers all in one go. And of course, when we are playing uh, Pokemon catchers, it's another dig towards Gust. And that's always a uh, nice feeling to have here. So I think one stop is probably a little bit better than a third uh, copy of Rose Tower overall. Then we have this sort of spooky Mew, I'm going to call it, because you have horror energy in Old Cemeteries, and I couldn't really think of a much better uh, name for it. Uh, but this is going to be trying to have these mini damage modifiers to help out alongside your tablets and your choice belts to actually get over the line into some of these chunkier guys. Of course, uh, we know that Arceus is not just going to be 280 hit points most of the time. You also have to get around their big charm, so... Trying to push them into range is going to be a big deal here. I've added a Silene into this list specifically because I'm only playing one double turbo. So sometimes the Silene will act as that second double turbo copy. Sometimes it'll act as that power tablet. Uh, and sometimes it can just grab other things that you've had to discard aggressively with your ball search cards just to get into the game in the first place. Silene is a very versatile card. It is based on coin flips, which no one really likes. Uh, but it does give you that little bit of flexibility rather than just adding in a second copy of, for example, a double turbo, which is kind of where I want to place the spot, but the Silene is just much more versatile uh, when you are trying to get as many damage mods as possible into these um, big V-stars. So my closing thoughts from you then, it has had somewhat of a fall from grace, but I do still believe it has some of the best high rolls possible in the game. Going first with Mew still does feel very powerful. If you are able to establish a board, you're holding that boss's orders combo in hand to be able to just target down whatever they've got going. In those early stages really does put the opponent on the back foot. And with a ton of Inteleon engines expected to be popular at Worlds, you really can punish weak starts from them. And even with the likes of Marnie and Roxanne, it can take them a lot of turns to make a comeback. And even if you don't immediately draw a stadium out, uh, you can sometimes still get over the line just by swinging multiple times with a Mew, uh, even under a lock. So I think uh, you really do wreck some weak starts and that's just a great feeling to have at Worlds where you get quick wins under your belt and that's something that you really want to have at Worlds when ties are very bad for you. Also, I do think Mew Genesect can be one of these decks that feels very rewarding to those who can learn good sequencing and also manage their resources appropriately, knowing when to bail on certain options and just dump the hand down as low as possible to get digging towards pieces, or when you can hold on to precious cards, even if it means drawing less this turn and having maybe a less good turn overall to be able to blow the opponent up on a future one. It's definitely something you need to weigh up as the new player, and it can be very rewarding for those who are able to navigate it properly. Some of the biggest fears for a new player going into Worlds, Roxanne and Path is common in both Palkia and Arceus, so you're not necessarily targeting any deck in the format. Uh, those sort of best matchups that were shown in those favorable columns aren't going to be all that popular, I don't think. So you've got a hard slog into basically every deck in the room, uh, so you have to play well, and you also have to expect a lot of path coming in your face, as well as Roxanne being a common card. So even if people aren't necessarily teching from you, Roxanne and path aren't really going anywhere. They're going to see play at Worlds for sure. Also, I think there are times when you just draw things in the wrong order, and that's when Mew feels very bad. <laughs> Either you don't get early game Genesex rolling, and you're just stuck with really weird cards like Sparkle that don't really do anything, or Boss just used for a panic play, and you know that your deck is so much weaker when the VIP passes haven't come off that you just draw more and more jank as you go. Or even if you have got your Genesex into play, and you've just drawn like two or three supporters all in one go, you don't really feel like ultra balling away double boss or something like that and you just know that your game plan completely changes because you just draw too many things in the wrong order obviously of course the fusion energy is another one where 
you want to try and avoid drawing that almost the entire game if you can to always have the option to sparkle and sometimes it doesn't work out that way as we know <laughs> and that's always a headache for Mew. Do you think Mew is going to see play at Worlds? I know it's become a lot less popular as this format has gone on and I don't think it gains too much from Pokemon Go. The Pokestop is a decent include but I don't think all the lists will even go down that avenue regardless so can it still fight among these top decks in the format as we have seen Path continue to be a hugely popular card and the matchup spread's not looking all that appealing for Mew. The only real thing you have on your side is that you probably draw better than the majority of decks uh, in the game and that still counts for a lot I would say. So let me know your thoughts down below and I'll see you in another video tomorrow. Cheers.